My name is Reagan, a 45-year-old working mother with a journey marked by both triumphs and tribulations over the past three decades. Armed with an associate's degree, I've amassed 25 years of expertise in the real estate realm. Life has led me through highs and lows, including two marriages and the joy of motherhood with my son Isaac. My first marriage, back in my 20s, ended tragically with the loss of my husband in a car accident. Gavin, my current husband, two years my junior, became my beacon of light during those dark times. Despite his initial struggles as a salesman, his unwavering support and affection eventually won me over. Three years after my loss, I found solace in Gavin's love and married him. Fast forward 17 years and Isaac, our son, now 15, fills our lives with pride as he immerses himself in his high school studies and science projects. Yet, tranquility gave way to uncertainty when Gavin proposed inviting his mother to live with us after his father's passing. While I empathized with her loneliness, the prospect of cohabiting with my mother-in-law posed logistical challenges. Concerns for Isaac's studies and our household dynamics weighed heavily on my mind. The spare bedroom, usually reserved for occasional guests, suddenly became a focal point in our deliberations. Gavin's suggestion of utilizing it for his mother seemed practical, offering her solace while potentially easing our domestic burdens. However, the prospect of disrupting Isaac's academic pursuits and the delicate balance of our household loomed large. The notion of my mother-in-law assuming household responsibilities to afford me more time with Isaac brought both relief and trepidation. As I grappled with the decision, the complexities of familial obligations intertwined with personal desires. The path forward remained uncertain, with the welfare of Isaac and the harmony of our home at the forefront of my considerations. She can even prepare late night snacks for him, he said simply. Isaac often had to resort to fast food for dinner when staying late at school with his research team. I, like many working mothers, felt a pang of guilt for not being able to provide homemade meals like other moms did. Charles's suggestion seemed like a solution that would bring joy to Isaac's evenings. Beyond the practicalities, I empathized with Kara's loss and hoped to ease her grief by welcoming her into our home. So when she moved in one day after leaving her rental apartment, I believed it was the right decision. However, things took an unexpected turn. Kara's arrival marked a dramatic shift in both her and Gavin's behavior. Witnessing her maternal love manifested in the way she doted on Gavin, I couldn't help but feel conflicted. While her affection was understandable, I questioned the appropriateness of treating a 44-year-old man like a child. Kara's nurturing gestures, like feeding Gavin as if he were a toddler, began to redefine their dynamic. Gavin, once independent and considerate, morphed into a self-centered and entitled individual under her care. His newfound dependency clashed with the image of the responsible husband and father I had known. Moreover, Kara's insistence on enforcing her maternal authority over me and others only exacerbated the situation. Her expectation for us to cater to Gavin's every whim disregarded our autonomy and strained our relationships. As tensions mounted, I found myself grappling with conflicting emotions. While I sympathized with Kara's loss and admired her maternal devotion, I couldn't ignore the negative impact her presence was having on our family dynamic. The line between love and overbearing control blurred, leaving us all navigating uncharted territory. Can't you even share the bed with your husband? Such an awful wife, Kara's words echoed in my mind, but I remained steadfast. Gavin's transformation under her influence was disconcerting, to say the least. Once a respectful husband, he now echoed her criticisms and belittled me. The change in Gavin's demeanor was startling. Before Kara's arrival, he referred to her as Mae, but now he called her Mommy. 
Hearing a grown man in his 40s address his mother with such a childish term was unsettling. Even our 50-year-old son had adopted the same term, adding to my discomfort. As Kara's control over Gavin solidified, the dynamic became increasingly bizarre. I cringed as I watched her feed him like a child, my actions permeated with an unsettling level of infantilization. The sight of a grown man eagerly accepting spoonsful of food from his mother only intensified my unease. Their interactions bordered on the absurd, and I couldn't shake off the feeling of disgust that welled up within me. I found myself wondering if they would soon start holding hands in public, their relationship taking on an uncomfortably intimate tone. Kara's behavior extended beyond her relationship with Gavin. Despite her initial promises to contribute to household chores, she remained idle, spending her days watching TV in her room. Instead of fulfilling her responsibilities, she criticized my efforts and attempted to undermine me at every turn. Her lack of contribution to the household was compounded by her interference with Isaac's studies. Rather than supporting him, she became a distraction, disrupting his focus with her incessant presence. Despite my attempts to address these issues, Kara remained obstinate, always seeking to garner Gavin's support by painting herself as the victim. Her manipulative tactics only served to deepen the divide between us, leaving me feeling isolated and frustrated. In the face of Kara's unwavering control and Gavin's compliance, I realized that reclaiming my autonomy would require a decisive action. It was clear that allowing Kara to continue exerting her influence over our lives would only lead to further discord and unhappiness. Charles adjusted the volume without a second thought, despite my harsh complaints. What's wrong with you? I snapped. My hearing is bad. Let me watch it as loud as I want, she retorted defiantly. A disregard for Isaac's need to concentrate infuriated me. When I confronted her, she made baseless accusations against him, claiming he wasn't focused enough if the noise bothered him. Isaac's late-night study sessions at school became the norm, as Charles refused to cooperate in reducing the noise. She incessantly called his cell phone, berating him for staying out late. When I intervened and took away her phone, she lashed out, blaming me for Isaac's lack of discipline. Her hysterical outburst drove me to seek refuge with a neighbor, but Charles's persistence knew no bounds as she barged into their homes, sparking quarrels. Regret gnawed at me as I realized the gravity of my decision to let her move in. Even if I mustered the courage to evict her, she had nowhere else to go. Refusing to stay with her siblings in a remote area due to her modest retirement and aversion to farm work, she remained steadfast in her refusal to leave. Faced with the prospect of our family's ruin, I made a difficult decision and demanded her departure. But Charles, emboldened by Gavin's tacit approval, refused to comply. Who decided such a thing? She smirked, leaning on Gavin for support. His silence spoke volumes as he echoed her sentiment, citing her supposed tolerance of our grievances. Their united front shattered any hope of resolution, leaving me grappling with a sinking feeling of despair. Despite my best efforts, it seemed our family was destined to be torn apart by Charles's unwavering presence. You two should be more considerate. It's terrible of you to just kick her out. Charles scolded, her voice dripping with contempt. I remained resolute in my decision to have her leave but then she uttered something utterly bewildering. If you don't want to leave with me, you leave. This is Gavin's house anyway. Leave Isaac with us and get out of here. I was incredulous. Leave my own home? Gavin, visibly uncomfortable beside his mother, remained silent as she continued her tirade. He worked hard to buy this place, she taunted, and I highly doubt you make enough to afford such a house. Her words cut deep, accusing me of taking advantage of Gavin's kindness and financial stability. Before Gavin could interject, Charles launched into another attack, 
questioning the very foundation of our marriage. Why do you think I let him marry an older and used woman like you in the first place? She spat, her tone dripping with disdain. I recoiled at the insult, shocked by her audacity. Otherwise, I would have never agreed to this marriage, you ex-widowed used woman. The derogatory term struck a nerve, and I demanded an explanation for such disrespect. To my dismay, Gavin failed to defend me, instead admitting that his mother had orchestrated our marriage for her own reasons. Mom used to say I need to get married and have a son with whoever, he confessed, his words a painful betrayal. To be honest, I did think it would be easier to appease her with a sad widow woman. Stunned by his callous admission, I struggled to comprehend the depth of his deception. Every aspect of our relationship, from the proposal to our life together, had been orchestrated by Charles. The realization left me reeling, grappling with the harsh truth of my own naivety. It didn't matter who, as long as she could use me as a means to produce a child. Now that Isaac has grown up, I'm no longer needed, Charles triumphantly declared. Leave him behind, and you, get out of this house. I will discipline him from now on and raise him to be an impeccable man. In that moment, my entire 17-year marriage crumbled before my eyes. Every ounce of affection and kindness from Charles felt like a cruel facade, leaving me shattered beyond belief. I resolved to initiate divorce proceedings, but before I could utter a word, fate intervened. A relative of Charles passed away, necessitating an extended funeral trip to a remote location. With many customs to observe and the funeral proceedings expected to last at least a week, Gavin managed to secure a last-minute, paid leave from his lackluster sales job. It was a surprising turn of events considering his usual indifference. Charles insisted that Isaac accompany her to the funeral, despite his research team's critical final tests that week. I insisted we wait until Isaac's commitments were fulfilled before joining them. Charles's sarcastic remarks about Isaac's eventual inheritance of the family land only fueled my determination to enact my plan. As Gavin and Charles departed for the funeral, Leaving Isaac and me behind, I seized the opportunity to set my plan in motion. Three days later, during the funeral, I sent a text to Gavin. I'm divorcing you. Isaac is coming with me. Goodbye, I texted Gavin, anticipating his shock. His response of three question marks confirmed his confusion. Four days later, Charles called in a panic, demanding to know why they couldn't enter the house. I calmly informed her that I had changed the locks to prevent unwanted entry. Her indignation flared, questioning if I considered them weird. I clarified that it wasn't just her, but Gavin too, who I deemed unwelcome. When she inquired about Isaac's whereabouts, I mentioned he was studying beside me in our new, smaller apartment where he found better concentration without disturbances. Explaining our departure, I mentioned the convenience of my real estate connections, allowing us to swiftly secure a new residence. Charles, still clinging to the notion that the house belonged to Gavin, was stunned to learn the truth it was mine. Her shock at this revelation was palpable. Seizing the moment, I disclosed my intention to sell the house, unwilling to endure the intrusion any longer. Charles was left speechless when I referred to Gavin as the worst salesman. In a few days, he would receive divorce papers, and his meager salary would hardly cover any potential alimony. Let's just get it over with quickly, I suggested, eager to finalize the divorce proceedings. Charles, however, had a different perspective. Yeah, right. You don't understand, do you? When a couple gets divorced, their assets must be divided between them. Half of the sales will go to Gavin, she asserted, attempting to maintain composure. With a chuckle, I revealed a crucial detail. Charles, I don't have to share the assets I had prior to the marriage. I bought it with my ex-husband's life insurance. I explained, 
relishing her stunned silence at the unexpected legal provision. Realizing the futility of her argument, Charles shifted tactics, demanding Isaac's custody. Then return Isaac to us. I'm not giving up the custody of my only grandson. She shrieked, her desperation palpable. In response, I involved Isaac in the conversation, allowing him to voice his opinion. Hey Isaac, your grandma says she wants to live with you. She says you can take her inheritance. What do you want to do? I asked, switching on the speakerphone. Isaac's unequivocal rejection was clear. No way, I can't. That's out of the question. She and Dad are really weird. I shudder to think what she would do to me if I became the heir of her family, he declared, throwing aside his magazine. With Isaac's refusal settled, I ended the call, dismissing Charles's futile attempt to manipulate the situation. He doesn't want to be the heir, so please find someone else, I stated firmly, cutting off any further debate. As the divorce proceedings concluded, I reflected on the outcome. Well then, take care. Gavin and I got divorced. I informed Charles before ending the call. Despite the challenges, the lawyer I enlisted through my work connections had secured a substantial lump sum in child support, ensuring a measure of financial stability moving forward. Gavin attempted to seek legal advice from various lawyers, but none were willing to take on his case. It was evident that his chances of success in a lawsuit were slim, especially considering his reputation as the worst salesman. With the strategic use of my career resources, the house was sold under favorable terms, ultimately resulting in Gavin and Charles losing their home. Following the divorce, Gavin distanced himself from his previous dependence on Charles, no longer living under her roof. Charles, left with few options, reluctantly relocated to a remote area and found herself compelled to work on a farm. The irony of her situation brought a sense of satisfaction, especially recalling her past declarations of disdain for rural life. As for me, I remained focused on my career, determined to work diligently until my retirement. The prospect of a comfortable life with a full pension awaits, serving as a beacon of hope for the future.